starting with our overarching type of shape, the parallelogram. So we're kind of talking about our shapes in a hierarchy kind of format. So parallelogram is the overarching broad description of shapes that we're going to be talking about. And then on day three, we're going to talk about specific types of parallelograms, the square rectangle compass. So we're just starting with the general idea, understanding the kind of general properties of these shapes. Then we're going to hone in on specific properties of specific types of parallelograms um, after that. And then we're going to transition into shapes that are not parallelograms, our trapezoid and our height, and talk about how those are different and what we know about those as well. Right? But today we're just going to set our foundation by talking about parallelograms. All right, so our definition of parallelogram, how many sides do you think it has? Four. So it is a quadrilateral. It's a quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides. This is our official definition. Quadrilateral with two pairs of parallel sides. Right? So the top and bottom are going to be par parallel, the left and right are going to be parallel, or whatever orientation it's in. But both pairs of those sides are going to be parallel. Now, what we're going to be talking about are four properties of a parallelogram, and they're going to be written in what format? What would I call this kind of statement? A biconditional. So these properties that we're about to learn, they're written in biconditional format, which means that they're true in both directions. Remember, a biconditional is true going the forwards direction and the backwards direction. Um, so what I've done is I've kind of split up the biconditional in its two formats, the original and then the converse. Both of them are true, but you use them in different ways. So our forwards direction going from P arrow Q, if it was just a normal if-then statement, that's what we would use to help us solve. So these four properties that we're going to look at, if we know first that it's a parallelogram and then we're trying to solve, we would use this resulting property to help us do that. But if I do the converse, if I see this and I'm trying to prove that it's a parallelogram, that's when I would use Q or OP, the other direction. All right, so going forwards with these rules is going to be how we solve. Going backwards is how you prove that something is a parallelogram if you don't know that it is in the first place. All right, so our first property, um, a quadrilateral is a parallelogram if and only if, what do you think this is? How do you think I would express this in words? But what relationship do the sides have to each other? Opposite. So if and only if opposite sides are, you know, Opposite, missed word side, opposite sides are congruent. We already know that they're parallel by the definition of talking about what else can we figure out about a parallelogram. So if you know that something is a parallelogram, then you know that its opposite sides are congruent and vice versa. If you know that a shape has congruent opposite sides, you know that it then has to be a parallelogram. All right, the second one. A quadrilateral is a parallelogram if and only if opposite angles are congruent. All right, so again, going in the forwards direction, if you know something is already a parallelogram, you can conclude that the angle, opposite angles are congruent, and use that to help you solve. Or you can go backwards. If you notice a quadrilateral has opposite congruent uh, angles, then you can say it's a parallelogram. So two different ways to use that. All right, property three. A quadrilateral is a parallelogram if and only if what? What do you think that is? How would I express what this is? What's going on there? What might I call something like BD? multiple somebody's diagonal, right? B, D, and A, C, those are called diagonals. So what's happening? They are intersecting in what way? Which is, in one word, bisecting. To intersect, to cut them in half is one word, bisecting. 
So a quadrilateral is a parallelogram if and only if the diagonals bisect each other. Alright, so with built in here means that they both have to be cut in half. It's not just one that's cut in half, they both are cutting each other in half. So this is equal to this and that's equal to that. Now notice how along one diagonal I used a single hash mark and along the second one I used two hash marks. So what do you think that means about their full lengths? They're different. They're different. The full lengths of the diagonals are different, but each separate diagonal is being cut in half. All right, so that's why I have separate marks for these two halves and those two halves. So that's an important concept to remember. The full diagonals are not equal, it's just that they've been chopped in half. Okay, exclusive from each other. All right, then this last one, a quadrilateral is a parallelogram if and only if. Uh -huh. Supplementary. Consecutive, I'm going to leave out the word interior because that's... Uh, it excludes exterior because we don't have the extension, so I'm just going to say consecutive. Consecutive angles are supplementary. It's true that they are the interior ones, but just to avoid redundancy. Alright, so it's a parallelogram if and only if consecutive angles are supplementary. Now this should make sense, right, because the sides are parallel, and with any parallel lines, aren't the consecutive angles supplementary? That's one of our properties, right? So because these are parallel, that means that both pairs of consecutive angles here are supplementary. Because the vertical line, sorry, the upward lines are parallel, it means that the, uh, these consecutive angles are also supplementary. The only thing that you can't say is that B, D are supplementary and C and A are supplementary. What's the relationship between the opposite ones? Oh. Opposites are congruent, consecutive are supplementary. Don't mix the two. Right. Make sure you keep those straight. So those are the four. Those are what you guys are responsible for knowing about a parallelogram. Those four things: opposite sides are equal, opposite angles are equal, the diagonals bisect each other, and the consecutive angles are supplementary. Right? Forwards and backwards. You can use those. Now, these next two that I have, these asterisks, uh, aster, whatever. These extra asterisks. I don't know. These two statements right here. We use these to, uh, as well to prove that things are. A parallelograms, they are not properties of parallelograms like the ones that we have numbered one through four. These are extra little things that are a little, that are more rare to see, particularly this one that I'm about to say. Uh, but they're still useful in proving that something is a parallelogram. So this one right here, this first one, you could say that if one, and I'm gonna write this in all caps, if one pair of opposite sides, sides is parallel and congruent. If one pair of opposite sides is parallel and congru and congruent, I have trouble talking today, then a quadrilateral is a parallelogram. So this is weird. If you guys want to draw a little picture so you can see what I mean, this is what I'm talking about. If you have a little parallelogram here and all you know is that one pair of sides is both parallel and congruent, that's enough to prove that it is a parallelogram. It is rare that you'll see this kind of scenario, but you need to know that if you see that, that is enough. You can see that and say it's a parallelogram. Even though it doesn't match any of the four properties we've, properties we've mentioned uh, previously, this is enough. It's like another mini property that you guys can use. Right? And then this last one, if uh, both pairs of sides are parallel, then it's a parallelogram. That's just using the definition of parallelogram. If both pairs of sides are parallel, then by definition it's a parallelogram. So that's just a kind of no-duh thing, but I felt it's still useful to write down so you guys know you can actually use it. So you have your four properties after you already know it's a parallelogram. You have this extra rare one, and then you have the definition that you can use to prove that something is a parallelogram. All right, so that's really our foundation. Now all we're going to do is practice the, the proving stuff, like these little pictures here. We're going to see if they're parallelograms or not, based on what we know so far. Then on the other page, we're going to practice solving. 
and then we're going to take a look at formal proofs like the, the two column proofs we've been working with um, in the context of parallel turns. So first off, this little section here, I want to know if these shapes that I see are parallelograms. So we're going to analyze what information we know and see if we can come up with an answer. So this one right here, I know the markings are a little bit small, um, so I'll make them a little bigger for you guys. So this shape says that those two sides are equal, they're equal to each other, and they're also parallel to each other. Would this be a parallelogram? Yes. This is that rare scenario I was telling you guys about that you wrote right there. That is one way you can prove something or determine if something is a parallelogram. All right, what about this one? Is this a parallelogram? Why? It's not just because they intersect, they bisect. Yeah, so they bisect each other. What number of property is that? Like two or three? Okay. I'm just going to write the property so you guys can see why. I would like you guys to defend your answer. Not saying the diagonals bisect each other, at least give me like a, a reference to what we're using. So, yes, this is a parallelogram because we use the backwards direction of the biconditional for that. What about this one? Does this look like any of the properties? Does that mean you automatically rule it out as a parallelogram? No. Think about it. What's going on here? These single ha single mark angles, what would I call those? They're alternate interior. If these are alternate interior angles and they're congruent, what does that lead you to conclude? Which ones? Okay, so using the converse of the alternate interior angles theorem, converse of that, says that if the alternate interior angles are equal, then those are parallel. Can I do that for the other set? Yes. So using those angles and the converse of the theorems we've talked about, I get that both sets of sides are parallel. So is this a parallelogram? Yes, it yes. is. By definition. If both sets of sides are parallel, then parallelogram. This one says that both of these sides are 12 and both of these sides are parallel. Is that enough to prove that it is a parallelogram? No. Are both sets of sides parallel? No. Are both sets of opposite sides congruent? No. no. Is it enough to have one of each? No. no. Well, only if it's the same set of sides. Right. So this one would be a no. I'm going to also follow that up with not enough information because it's possible that they could be. We just don't know if they are based on the information that we have. All right, what about this one? Yeah. Why? Because uh, quadrilaterals add up to 360. Okay. Quadrilaterals add up to 360, so does that allow me a flat to find a single? Yes. Can you do that, it's 120. Now what? So it's a quadrilateral, that's all I know so far. Now how can I conclude that it's a parallelogram? It's a parallelogram because there are two sets of opposite angles. Okay, so the opposite angle, I'm not going to do that. That idea. But the opposite angles, both pairs of opposite angles are congruent. You do have to have both, just one is not enough. So you have both pairs of opposite um, angles are congruent, or what other property could you use? Or the supplementary one. So you could either use the opposite ones are both congruent, or you have all those consecutive angles are supplementary. All right, this one has, these are parallel, those are parallel. Parallelogram? Yes. Yes, that's again the definition. Both sets of sides are parallel. What about this one? Why? No, that is not why. What happens when you add 135 and 65? They're not supplementary. It's not that there's not enough information, it's that the information they provided is false. Or it's it's not matching for a parallelogram. So because these are not supplementary, this would not be a parallelogram, and you would not continue by saying not enough information, it's just, it's it's not, right? The angles are not supplementary. Angles aren't supplementary. All right, what about this one? Yes. Why? Because corresponding angles Nope. We have no, wait, so, wait, hold on. What were you about to say about corresponding angles? Corresponding angles are 
Okay, I thought you were going in a different direction. Okay, go ahead. With that, what does that lead me to? Um, top lines are parallel. These? Yeah, one and bottom. This one? And yeah. this one? Yeah. Okay, I thought you were going in a different direction, so that's fine. You're using the converse, right? The converse yeah. of uh, the uh, postulate, yeah. the corresponding angles postulate, leads us to believe that those are parallel. What else? Going in that same direction. Um, and you could use the converse for the left and right sides. Yeah, you could also use the 70 and that 70 as the corresponding angles and use the converse to show the lines are parallel. So then how would I, for what, re for what reason would I say that this is a parallelogram? Parallelogram definition. Yeah, it's basically just the definition again. Now there's another way you could do this. You could find, use a linear pair to bring the angles inside. And then find that one, and then do opposite angles or congruent or the consecutive or supplementary. There can be a couple different ways to do these questions, as you'll see when we go on to the next page. But whatever you guys want to do is fine, as long as it's valid. Uh, when I All right, now we're going to practice solving before we go into our uh, proofs, formal proofs. All right, so basically what you're going to do is use the forward direction of the properties we learned on the previous page. You're going to figure out what property matches best and then use it. So in this picture, I've described for you that these shapes are parallelograms at the uh, top of the page. That's why I don't have any markings in here. But pay very close attention to this. When, you got, when we've learned all these shapes, the parallelogram, the square, the rectangle, the rhombus, the kite, the trapezoid, I may or may not tell you what shape it is that I'm giving you, and you have to look at the markings to decide what shape it is so that you know how to approach the question. So just know in the future, once we've learned all the shapes and they're all mixed together, you may have to look more closely to figure out what shape am I actually working with so you know what to do. But for this lesson, everything on here is a parallelogram. I'm telling you up front. All right, so AD is 5x. A, B is 2x, and C, D is y. I know the perimeter is 84. How do I proceed? I need to find both x and y. Yes? So 2x equals y. OK, so I can shift the 2x over here, right? because opposite sides are equal. So I can write this side right here is equal to y and 2x. I'm going to write a little equation there, save that for later. What else could I do? Do I have enough information to solve for either of the variables right now? Um, yes. No. Uh, In order to use perimeter, what do you need? All, the all four sides. So help me out here. Oh. What side do I not know? Well, and how do I figure out what it is? C. It's also 5x, right? They give you this side, and because opposite sides are equal, you can also write 5x right there. That's why they didn't tell it to you. They expected you to know that. And so now for the perimeter, I can add all of the x expressions for all four sides together, giving me 14x. When you divide, you get the x is 6. And then with the equation that we talked about before, where this was originally y, but it's also 2x, with this little equation, I can plug the 6 in. So what would the value of y be? 12. 12. Pretty basic stuff with the, the solving type of things. <coughs> Okay, so I was using property number one with the opposite side being congruent. Over here I have AE is equal to X plus Y, EC is equal to 20. Uh, this is X minus Y, and this is 8. All right, what property do I use in this, this situation? <coughs> bisect each other. I think that's property number three that we were talking about. So how do I take that and actually get an equation out up there? Yes? Yep. So the idea of bisect means that they've been chopped into equal parts. So I can say that the parts of this diagonal are equal and the parts of that diagonal are equal. Uh, so I have this now. How do I solve this kind of thing? Remember what it's called? System. We've talked about it, linear systems. We 
we've talked about this before. This is algebra. You guys should know how to do this. I'm not going to teach you. You've already been taught that. Um, so there are two ways to solve systems, either substitution or elimination. This is set up really nicely for elimination. Um, so for elimination, you just add down the columns. The y's cancel. I don't have to adjust anything. Sometimes you do. But I don't have to here because the y's are already easily canceled. So I get this. x equals 14. The elimination method. And then once I know x, how do I find y? Plug it back in. So either one of these are two. Uh, either one of these two equations is fine. So let's say you like the top one. If I have 14 minus y is equal to 8, then I can solve 6. Okay, so if you're not so great with systems, make sure you brush up on that. But again, that's algebra, so I expect you to know that. Alright, everybody clear? Alright, next row, number three. A, B is 2X, B, C is 30, C, D is 7X minus 25, and E, D, well I did not draw that very well, so hold on. Y minus 4, okay. Alright, how would I approach this one? Expressions are on opposite sides, and opposite sides are congruent. For a parallelogram, right? Opposite sides are congruent. So I can solve for x first. Doesn't matter which variable to solve for first, but if you choose to do that one, that's okay. And so ultimately, you should get x is equal to 5 using your algebra. Yes? Oh, did I do it wrong? Oops, sorry. Here we go. Yeah, that would have caused an issue in trying to solve the, the y. All right, but now that I have that labeled correctly, sorry about that. Everybody okay with x, though? I didn't mess that one up. That one's right. So x is 5. Everybody clear on that? Okay, so now that I have the correct diagonal labeled as 30, how would I solve for y using that information? Um, so be careful how you say it. You just said the diagonals are congruent. You want to be careful. It might mean the parts of the diagonal. Okay. So the segment, the two segments of this diagonal BD are equal, right? Because it was bisected. So there are two ways you guys can approach this, actually. You can put another y minus 4 here to get it to match the 30. So you could say 2y minus 8, right? Yeah, then together set equal to 30. What's another way you could do it? Um, y minus 4 times 2. Well, that's the method I was just saying. What's an alternate uh, way of doing it? Instead of doing the entire thing is equal to 30, what else could you do? Yeah, y minus 4 is just equal to 15, half the 30. So you can either expand the problem out, so put another y minus 4 here, add them together, set equal to 30, or you could shrink the 30 down, chop the 30 in half, and say that y minus 4 is equal to just 15, half the 30. I prefer this because it's smaller numbers and it just is faster. But either way, you'll get y is 19. There are always two ways to approach that. You can either expand to fit the full length or chop everything in half. Uh, but you'll get the same answer either way. Your preference. All right, everybody clear on that? Everybody go with the first three? All right, I'm going to try number four and then let you guys do number five and six on your own. So this is now working with angles. So this is 4y minus 60. This is 2y. And then angle B is x. How would I approach this? Which uh, variable do I have to find first? How come? I understand that's a relationship, but why do I have to solve for y first? Okay, so there's no other variable to help you with the x, yes. So the y is the variable that shows up the most, and the relationship is that they're opposite. What do you know about opposite angles? They're congruent. 
in parallelograms. So 4y minus 60 equals 2y. Algebra, blah, 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 30. Okay, so yeah, you notice that they're opposite angles. They should be congruent here at the equation you solve. All right, now how can I solve for x? There are no linear pairs. Or no supplementary. Okay, supplementary, but they're not a linear pair. What kind of angles are they? Which angle? What angle would you want to use to help you find x? Um, either 4y, or yeah, 4y. Okay, so angle A. So what's the relationship between angle A and angle D? What do I call those? Not a linear pair there. Supplementary. That's their relationship in terms of measures. What kind of angles are they in the picture? Oh, consecutive. Consecutive, there you go. So A and D are consecutive, but so are C and D. So it really doesn't matter which one you plug it into, actually. So you can plug 30 into angle A, get that value, and then do supplementary this way. Or you can plug it into angle C and do supplementary this way, because any pair of consecutive angles are going to be supplementary. It doesn't really matter. But when you plug them in, the angle here or here is 60. So then X plus 60 equals 180 leads you to X being 120. All right, so when you guys are solving, you'll notice that there are a couple different routes you can take. It just depends on your perspective within the parallelogram. They're going to be equally as valid. Just make sure you pick the one that makes most sense to you. So either set of consecutive angles will work. All right, go ahead and do number five and number six on your own, please. I'll put the answers up on the board so you can check when you are done. And then we'll move to the proofs on the other page. Do you have a question? Huh? Yeah. Five and number six, please. Put the answers up in a second. So hopefully with these two, you guys are able to figure out how to solve those. We're going to okay with number five, supplementary with the consecutive angles, and then once you find x, plug in and use opposites. Everybody's okay with number five? Okay, number six is another system. You just have to manipulate the equations a little bit more algebraically to get it to work if you're using elimination. It's not as immediately convenient when you guys write the equations. Alright, it should look like this initially. Because neither of the variables have the same coefficient with opposite signs, you can't immediately cancel stuff. So just remember for that kind of system, again, I'm not going to really go into too much in detail because you're supposed to know that, um, but you multiply one of the equations so that the coefficients of a variable are going to be the same number but opposite signs, and then you can add down the pencil. Okay, so again, you guys should know how to work with systems that way and manipulate things. So just if you're not comfortable with that, make sure you go home and review that really quickly in your algebra materials or online or something. All right, so that's basically what it is. So that's the expectation for you guys with solving. Expect to see systems, factoring maybe, although that will probably be in a different context a little later on. Um, but that's basic just a bit. Any questions? All right, now we're going to take a look at the proofs that you guys are going to be expected to see um, or work with with parallelograms. So this is still using the properties. 
right? We're going to look to see what do I know, how can I prove that this is a parallelogram, or if I know that it's a parallelogram, how can I conclude that angles are congruent or something like that. Um, so we're still using the properties, just in a different context here. All right, I think this one proof, too, before I printed it, when I was doing the answer key, it's actually longer than there are spaces, so just be prepared for that one. Uh, all right, so for this one, it says that ATRO, so I'm going to use this to make it highlighted, ATRO is right here. They are telling us that that is a parallelogram, and we also know that PT is congruent to IP. Be in a different order, but whatever, it doesn't matter. And we're trying to prove that this angle, I'm going to put little dots, O, I, R, this angle right here is congruent to, wait, is that what? Which one? Hey, oh, this one right here. That's what we're trying to prove here. Put the little dots there, okay? So the angles with the dots in them, that's what we're trying to prove are congruent. So first of all, let's just write the givens. A, T, R, O is a, this is the abbreviation that you guys can use if you don't want to write the full parallelogram. You can draw parallel program. <laughs> feel free to use that because the parallel symbol is the two little slanty lines. So feel free to do that. I don't really care. Um, that was given. I'm going to write the two givens on different lines. And then PT congruent to IP is also given. All right, so let's work with the um, this given first. I'm going to work with this. This is going to be a little bit more convenient if we work with that first. So what can I do with the fact that PT is congruent to IP, those two sides? Ready? Okay, so the, the full triangle, the big picture here is isosceles. So then what is that? Let me conclude. If I know the two sides are equal, then... Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go ahead and call it ATR. I'm going to use the name of what it is inside the parallelogram because we're about to switch to using the parallelogram. So that's this angle right here. It's congruent to what? OIR. Which is one of the angles in the proof statement. Okay? And how do I know that? What's our reason? Oh, okay. I saw Slee's base angle theorem. You can leave the word isosceles off. Most people just call it base angle theorem, but if you want to call it isosceles base angle theorem, that's cool too. Okay, so we use those two congruent sides to say that those two angles are equal. Now let's come back around and use this given. How can I use the fact that this is a parallelogram to get closer to these two angles being equal? Angle ATR is congruent to angle AOR because what? What's the relationship between these two? Opposite. So I'm going to say opposite angles in parallelograms are congruent. There's no names for a prop, like the they don't have theorem names, so you just briefly explain what's going on. All right, so opposite angles and parallelograms are congruent. Now what? How do I get here? Substitution. Substitution. So I can say angle OIR is congruent to angle AOR by substitution. Okay? That's how we use the parallelogram to help us out. Clear? Alright, this next one is a little long. Okay, so I have enough spaces on uh, my. How many spaces do you guys have? Wow. Okay, good. There we have I fixed it before I printed it. Good. <laughs> Alright, so. I know that A, B, D, E, this whole thing, I know this whole thing, oh no, 
That is a parallelogram. And then I know that F and C are midpoints. So that means that's happening. Actually, I don't need to do that. They can be the same because opposite sides are congruent, so they're just the same. I'm trying to prove that ABCF, the top portion of that, is also a parallelogram. Okay? So let's go ahead and start with the given. So A, B, D, E is a parallelogram, which is given. And then the other given, F and C are mid points. All right, let's go ahead and use the definition of midpoint to move forward. Uh, there, you can start with the parallelogram bit, the given, to move forward, but I like to use the, the given that's not related to a parallelogram first, so I get more information before I bring in the parallelogram stuff. It usually makes the proof go smoother. Um, so I know that AF is congruent to FE, and I'm going to write that both on the same line, and BC is parallel to CD. And why is that? Definition of midpoint. Sounds good. Right now what? is a true statement, but it's not going to be helpful. So see how A, B, and E, D are here, right? Yeah. Is there any way we're going to get either of those to be equal to this? Uh, no. no. So it's true information, but it's not helpful in proving that this is a parallelogram. Yes? Say it one more time. AF is similar. No, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. AF is parallel to BC. Okay, so I can say AF is parallel to BC. Now, why would I say that? Well, sort of, sort of. Sort of. Technically, see, technically this is fine as long as you're very very detailed in explaining your reason but um, if you're not this is a I don't want to say better but this is another way you could say that AE is parallel to BD first and then say that AF is parallel to BC and the only reason I would do that is because if you say that the full segments because we have the parallelogram idea if we say that the full segments of the parallelogram are parallel, then we can go to just the segments. It usually makes it a little bit neater to say that in two separate lines instead of one. So I'm just going to have AE is parallel to BD. That's the definition of parallelogram. Right? Remember, a parallelogram, its sides are parallel. So I can say AE is parallel to BD. And then all you really have to say to explain that AF is parallel to BC is that segments of parallel lines are parallel. Or you can replace lines and segments too, because those are technically segments, but whatever. So we're kind of, why, what's the purpose of shrinking it down to just AF and BC? Yeah. yeah, quadrilateral, right. We're trying to focus in on this quadrilateral, which just has those little segments here, the AF and the BC. Right? So we're just shrinking it down, narrowing our viewpoint here to focus on that. All right, so do you guys see what's happening here? Do you guys see what's happening? So what ultimately are we going to use to prove that this is a parallel? Okay. 
one. Yeah, that re that special one I was talking about, that rule number, f I don't care, it did have a number, but that one that said that if you have one pair of sides that are both uh, parallel and congruent, then it's a parallelogram. So that's what we're after in this proof. Um, but all that I have right now from midpoint is that these two are equal and those two are equal. Now you guys need to help me figure out that AF is congruent to BC, and you need to be specific about how you do that. I know you can see it in the way that we labeled it in the picture. I know you can see that, but I need you to explain to me why I was able to use single hash marks here as opposed to double ones. So do you guys remember at the very beginning I did this? And then I erased it and went to single marks? Right? Why did I explain why I did, or what did I explain on why I was, I was allowed to do that? Right. Yes? Um, why is A, B, and Yeah, so you first need, just like we said that A, E, and B, D are parallel, you first need to start with the full length of those being uh, congruent. So A, E, and B, D, the full lengths of those are congruent. That's opposite sides of parallelograms. Are congruent. The opposites are congruent, so now I know the full lengths are congruent. Now, if you're going to be thorough here, um, what we're going to have to use just really uh, briefly is the segment addition postulate. So, how would I define AE? Yeah. Yeah. AF plus FE, right? That's a segment addition postulate. But what do you guys know about AF and FE? They're equal. So I could write this, right? Could I write that? What lets me do that? Substitution. Substitution lets me do that. What else? I was just working with AE. Now what? Mm -hmm. Do the same thing for BD. So what? what's the definition or the description of BD? BC plus CD. Again, that's a segment addition postulate. Okay. And then what do I know? What do I know about B, C, and C, D? They're equal to each other, right? Now in this one, why did I plug, why did I choose to change them both to A, F instead of both changing them to F, E? Yeah, because A, F is in the, the quadrilateral we're trying to focus on, right? So what would I do here? Would I change them both to C, D or change them both to B, C? B, C. So I'm going to have B, C, I'm going to switch out the C, D because I know that they're equal which is essentially 2BC, right? And then I have a little bit of work I'm gonna kind of cram into one, one line, yeah. So what can I do here? Look, see how we have this right here? See this, this guy right here, I'm gonna put a little star. What can I do? with this and some new information that I now have. 2AF uh -huh. is equal to 2BC. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slash through the 2. All right, just because we don't have enough room. All right, so that was substitution. So essentially what we have here now is that we have our AF is equal to BC that we needed. And then can, do I have enough information now? I have this is equal to this, and I also have this is parallel to that. So now why would that be a parallelogram? Because if opposite sides are parallel and congruent, then they're parallelograms. Yes, very good. So I know this is low on the board. I don't want to scroll because it will erase everything. So I'm just going to write small over here. A, B, C, F. 
is a parallelogram, and then you just have to briefly write out that rule that we were discussing on the bottom of the first page. Um, a pair of opposite sides being congruent and parallel makes it a parallelogram. Abbreviate it however you want to as long as you can get the point across. Okay, so now that one was long, I put the longest one on here on purpose so you guys can kind of get the energy out on these. The ones that I'm going to ask you guys to do are more reasonable. Right, remember this one I told you it was really rare and the way that you prove that is tricky. So that's why I put that here so you guys can just see that. But the proofs that you guys are going to be expected to do are the more straightforward ones, like the one up there. Okay. So let's just do our last one to wrap up, and then we'll be done for today. So see how much shorter this one is, right? You guys are going to be expected to regularly do 12 line proofs. Okay. We aren't or we are You are not. Oh, oh, Sorry, are not. You are, so aren't, so aren't so expected so regularly to do 12 lines. No, it said you're supposed to do 20 lines. Not 12, 13, 13. Yeah, 13, 13. How about 16 and 20? All right, so this one is interesting. It's actually bringing back an interesting vocabulary word that we uh, learned in unit five. <laughs> So LM is in the same thing that where we learned altitude. The same lesson we learned altitude. We also talked about median, um, orthocenters, stuff like that. Um, so LM is a median of this triangle, J or G, L, K, that guy right there. And then we know LM is congruent to MJ. Now, if you guys do not remember what a median is, a median connects the vertex of a triangle to the midpoint of the side across from it. That's the definition of a median. Connects an L, it connects a vertex to the midpoint of the side across from it. So using the fact that it's a median, what markings can I put in this picture? Okay. Yes. So you have to use the definition of median to help you here, but because we know LM is a median, that means M has to be the midpoint, okay? So I have my givens, LM is a median. Did I put them on separate lines? I did, they're on separate lines. So given, and then, so what did I get from that? The fact that it's a median? What I read said? GM congruent to AM, right? Definition of median. Okay, the other given was the fact that LM is congruent to MJ. Take a look at the picture right now. How can I prove that LGJK is a parallelogram? Um, So L, G, J, K is a parallelogram because the diagonals are bisecting each other. Okay, so uh, if diagonals bisect each other, it's a parallelogram. Right, so that's pretty straightforward application of one of those properties. So that's your first little taste of proofs in this unit. So again, because the, they don't have name, like they don't have <laughs> theorem names, you just have to write them out in whatever way you guys can express that idea to me. Oh, just show me. 